or welcome back. My name is Brittany and today's video we are talking about some books that made me cry. If I can make it through this video without crying, that will actually be amazing. I don't think I'll be able to because <laughs> uh, these things just like choke me up a little bit. These books are in no particular order. I've got a list that I'm keeping track of anytime I cry. So and I really tried to like think about books that actually made me cry. Not just like the little sting in the corner and your eyes get watery, like cry. I actually sobbed for at least five minutes. That's what I'm counting. Um, because if I counted books that like got my eyes stinging and like, you know, like almost cried, that list would be way too long. So these are the books that had me actually crying. Let's just dive right in. The first book that made me cry was Carrie Soto is Back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I listened to this as an audiobook and I thought the audiobook experience was really great. It was narrated by a full cast and it was a super immersive listen. All the other supporting cast really did just help elevate the story and carry herself like her voice was really wonderful. Taylor Jenkins read can usually kind of get me a little teary eyed here and there uh, and this book was no exception. In this novel we are following Carrie and she was like best of the best top of the game in women's tennis. And I mean, she's got 20 slam titles, like she's it. She's been retired for about six years when we start our story and her title as like the reigning tennis champ is in jeopardy. Nikki Chan is younger, fresh, new, stepping up to take Carrie's title and Carrie's like, hell no. Mm -mm. So <laughs> she comes out of retirement to defend her title one last time at age 37, which in that sport is uncommon. I did look it up. There is a tennis association a couple hours away, which is news to me. But as far as like sports, tennis is not something I've ever seen or watched. Going into this as someone who's not into tennis, I still think it was very enjoyable. And when I finished the book, like I googled Carrie Soto just in case. I'm like, this has to be a match. Like I have to watch her play tennis somewhere. There's no way she's not real. <laughs> the matches, the intensity, like the way the game is described when Carrie's playing is so well done. It gave me like goosebumps when I was listening to her play tennis. So our main character Carrie is very like kind of unlikable. She's kind of bitchy sometimes. She's very focused. She's very driven. She has discipline and drive and like she's going to win this game, right? But she has this attitude and all of these good qualities, but kind of like at the detriment of being rude, being closed off, not opening up to others, um, sacrificing relationships because she's so driven towards her goal. So I think that just makes for a really interesting character to follow because she does things or says things. You're just like, oh God, Carrie. <laughs> but at the same time, like that really just makes her more human in my opinion because she is so multifaceted. What got me choked up with this novel is the relationship between Carrie and her dad. So he was a tennis pro during his prime, he's trained to carry, shared the love of the sport with her as a young girl and into adulthood. And he supported her through her professional career. His love for her is so unconditional uh, and beautiful. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, it's so beautiful. And like you just see them go through ups and downs together and the end of the book is very heartbreaking. It's emotional for many reasons, um, but that <laughs> was why I cried <laughs> without spoilers. Um, it really was that relationship between uh, Carrie and her dad. And it was so beautiful to read about. On a funner note, uh, on a little lighter side, Taylor Jenkins Reid is kind of known for mentioning her other works. In Carrie Soto is Back, we do get subtle nods to some of her other novels. And so if you've read them, it is kind of fun to like see. The next book that made me cry. This made me ugly cry, like bad. <laughs> A Man Called Uwe by Frederick Bachman. This is sadly the only Bachman I've read because he hurt me so bad. <laughs> I've not, I've not been ready to pick up another book by him um, because I've heard the rest of his books are equally as emotional, um, hard-hitting, beautifully written. Like I've just heard they're like kind of intense books to get into with the emotional journey he takes you on. So I have not read any more Bachman and that needs to change. I know it does. Like I do want to pick his stuff up. I just, you have to sometimes be ready for a sad book. You know what I mean? So this follows Uwe and he 
he's just an asshole. He's a grumpy old man. He's rude. He's very strict in his ways. He's very set in how things should be. Uh, you know, we all think he's a jerk and he just thinks we're all idiots. I feel like Uve can represent like at least one person in our lives that we know that's like this where you're like, God, like, what's wrong with you? Why are you such a dick? Without excusing that behavior, I'm not saying the way Uve acts or like the grumpy pants down the street acts is okay, but we do get some insight as to why Uve's like this. And as cliche as it is, we truly never know what someone's going through. And this book really highlights that. I do want to mention this is not on the back of the book, but the book does open with suicide. We get to meet him, see his day to day, but he's very much struggling with the loss of his wife and does attempt suicide. It's hard to read. It's not graphic or gory in that sense. Um, and without sounding calloused or like kind of messed up, it's funny in a strangely cosmic way because his efforts keep getting interrupted by his new, noisy, annoying neighbors who won't leave him alone. That is really kind of where the story just takes off. We get flashbacks, we get to see who Uwe was as a young man, we get to see him meet his wife and fall in love. Meanwhile, we're getting to know these neighbors who just like keep pestering him. <laughs> and it ends up being so sweet, so beautiful. The ending is heartbreaking. The ending got me and when I finished this book, I wasn't ready to be done being sad. I wanted to like be sad a little bit longer. <laughs> so I immediately turned on the um, translated movie for this and continued to cry. <laughs> I was a mess for a hot second. Overall, this was really, really well done. Uh, it made me feel a lot of things. I know this is on a lot of people's lists of books that made them cry and I would say for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> it got me. Um, so if it sounds good, definitely check it out if you're in need of a tearjerker. The next book that made me cry was kind of, it was surprising. I'm not gonna lie. And that was Billy Summers by Stephen King, narrated by Paul Sparks. I had picked this book up randomly on a whim. I've enjoyed Stephen King's writing and other novels in the past. And so I just was like, sure, haven't read it. Let's check it out. This book follows Billy. He is a war veteran and now he's a hitman. <laughs> He's putting his skills to use, if you will, as a hitman. And this book is kind of the classic take on Billy's last job. Uh, he wants to get out. He's done with that life. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> well, literally everything goes wrong for Billy. It's not good. This is interesting in that Billy himself is very complicated. I mean, he's kind of like Dexter, like the serial killer who kills serial killers. You know what I mean? Um, he strangely has his own moral compass. Like you can see he's still a good guy at his core, but it's like, well, what makes a good guy a good guy? Like, can you still kill people and be a good guy? Like that's explored. We get to learn about Billy and his PTSD, his traumatic experiences from war. The story is kind of set up in that he's got a few different identities during his job and after the job to keep himself safe. And like he ends up feeling bad for the people that he's lying to. Like even though he has to do this for a job, like he feels bad. And like, it's just very interesting to see such a complicated like juxtaposition of like, I'm doing this kind of bad thing. Like I got to kill this guy, but also like, I feel bad because I'm lying to Ethel down the street about who I really am. And she's going to be sad when she figures out who I really am. <laughs> and it's like, okay. So I really loved Billy as main character. When you look at Goodreads, it's listed as thriller, crime thriller, mystery, suspense, and that's all very true. But there is another genre I feel like this book strangely fits into. Ugh. And I'm like, I'm so hesitant to say it because it was a shocking, like, kind of subplot for me. Like, I didn't see it coming. Like I said, I went in very blind to this story. So when it happened, I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> and I ended up really liking it. Um, I'm just gonna say it because I don't think it ruins it and if anything maybe it'll pique your interest but there is a romantic subplot in this book and the romance is very complicated as well. It is not a traditional romance. Um, I don't think it's actually that great but it is but it's not. <laughs> like it's I don't know. It is borderline inappropriate but how it was done, how it was executed, like how our characters behave around this relationship. I thought it was really well done and that really is what led to such an emotional ending for me. That 
relationship that we get to explore coupled with King's storytelling style. So one of the covers Billy has with his identities is that he's an author. And so he does a really creative way of writing a story within a story because ultimately we end up getting that novel Billy's writing as the reader. So we're getting Billy Summers by Stephen King and an autobiography of Billy Summers throughout the book. And the way that story is told with this relationship and how it ends, like, oh my God, it just was so good. I cried. I really like Billy. (laughs) And love relationship just there's so many things that I really enjoyed I will say though just if you go into this book just know that there's obviously death Billy's a hitman that's his job there's talk of war trauma PTSD but also there is a lot of sexual assault in this book so just know that it's not really a light easy fun read but it was very well done I thought very beautifully written and one I need to add to my shelves because I liked it so much. The next book that made me cry was actually a recent read. I'm excited to talk about it in my wrap up. Is The Tears of Amber by Sophia Segovia, translated by Simon Bruni. And I did listen to this as an audiobook. I'll have the narrators on the screen because they did wonderfully. I feel like they really elevated this story for me. But this novel follows uh, Ilse and Arno, two German families during the rise of Hitler in East Prussia. And first of all, that's just incredibly fascinating. We get a lot of Jewish stories, um, but I feel like we don't always look at the Germans who are kind of stuck. I mean, it's interesting because we see the families support Hitler initially, like, you know, this new political power that, you know, all these promises, um, but then you see them be like, oh, like, like, I don't know about this guy. Um, And they're really just trying to survive. And that was interesting in and of itself to explore. It is a multi-POV story with Ilse and Arno kind of being, you know, at the center of our stories, but we get to meet their families as well. We get to see what they go through and ultimately their paths cross. Overall, it was a beautiful story. I loved it. I thought it was done really well. Um, It wasn't until the author's note though, the author's note like had me crying. (laughs) Oh my God. It was so, like, I'm not going to tell you what the author's note said. I highly encourage you to read the story and read the author's note after because it just changed my entire experience reading this novel. Um, (laughs) I can't even tell you. Um, It's happening. Yeah, it just changed my entire reading experience and made me think about basically what I had read in a different way. Um, And it took a pretty good story to like, holy shit. And I think that experience itself was really neat. Yeah, I that's about all I really want to say about that. There are really, I mean, horrific things our characters go through. Um, There's loss, death, trauma after war, like the trauma of surviving these tumultuous times. I mean, there's a lot of really awful things throughout the novel, but like I said, it wasn't until I got to the author's note where I fucking lost it. And ugh, it just was so good. I think like Sophia Segovia is like two for two for me as far as like making me cry and having really wonderful books. So I'm excited to have her stuff keep being translated to English. Uh, because she like really knocked out of the park with that one. The next book that made me cry is Lightbringer by Pierce Brown. This is the sixth book in the Red Rising saga and wow was this book a bitch. (laughs) This book was a doozy. (laughs) Uh, Okay my experience with Red Rising is a little complicated because I read the initial trilogy books one to three years ago. I kind of struggled with the writing style Overall, thought it was really fun, it was neat, and then decided to wait until all the books were out before I kept going. But then I had a coworker who had read Lightbringer and she was losing her mind and was like, I need to talk to somebody. And I was like, all right, you got it. So I ended up binging all six books in like a 10 day time span. I did the whole series on audiobook so that I clocked a lot of hours listening to this book. Not recommended. (laughs) Um, I would really encourage you, if you check this series out, and you find yourself affected by what you read, uh, I would really encourage you to take a break between arc one and two. That's how I really think of these books. You have the initial trilogy and then 
books four, five, six, and seven, Red God, which is what we're waiting on. And I would, I would take a break because the second arc, I feel like things really ramp up in like the graphic content increases, um, like the hard hitting moments. Um, things are very bleak and depressing for quite some time. I mean, we get some wins, but overall it's just like, it's kind of a tough go. I can't really tell you much about Lightbringer without spoiling the series, and I would never, never do that. That would be so messed up, <laughs> especially this one. <laughs> this follows Darrow, him and his family, they mine on the planet Mars, and they're told to mine this helium-3 to basically set up humans so they can eventually live on Mars. Uh, an event happens and ultimately Darrow is now part of the rebellion and realizes that they are not alone on Mars. They, they haven't been for quite some time. The society that Pierce Brown creates is really fascinating. It's color-based with golds at the top uh, and then it goes by colors and every color has a job. They have specific physical features, capabilities. It's just a very interesting color-based society with like a lot of Roman and Greek inspiration, lots of beautifully written speeches that our characters do, some nods to Homer and the Odyssey. So like a lot of things go into this novel. You might be like, really, I have to read six books to cry. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I think when I reread the series again, I think because I've got the hindsight of what happens, I think some of the other scenes earlier on might hit a little bit harder. So I, I will probably cry again. If you want to be emotionally impacted, I feel like you have to like put in the work as a reader too. I mean, we can't just expect an author to like make a sob in like two sentences. Like I put in the fucking work for this book and as painful as it was, I got the emotional payout that I didn't really want. <laughs> um, it was super well done. This really took me on a trip. This was like this book Finishing this one gave me like the worst book hangover I have ever had. And I think that's why like I, I'm telling you to break it up. <laughs> Take some breaks if you need to. Um, because reading all of these books got pretty heavy. And it still kind of shocks me actually that Red Rising is listed as young adult. Um, I think the first trilogy, like yeah, you know, and maybe, you know, let some teenagers read it. But like things really do ramp up in here and like I was a fucking wreck after reading it and I have like the emotional intelligence and capability to like take care of myself <laughs> so like and I was struggling um but yeah this was a oh, oh it's so good <laughs> it's so bad at the same time <laughs> Ugh, I'm just scared for this the conclusion of this I that's all I can say that is it you guys <sighs> I made it through pretty dang good without sobbing. <laughs> got a little choked up a couple times. I hope you enjoyed some books that made me sad. I've got a list of more, don't worry. If there's a book that has gotten you crying or tearful or choked up, drop it down below. So when I am feeling like crying, I know what to grab. I will see you in the next one. Bye.